Hi there, and welcome to the Axe Podcast. We have a special edition today with a special guest, Wilson Germain Heredia. Now, Wilson, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Thank you for asking. So uh, we have you here today uh, as part of our podcast to ask you some questions because you are starring in our production of American Idiot. Now, we're going to get to American Idiot in just a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. But first, I want to establish some, uh, some background information because I'm pretty sure that our audience here has a good idea of who you are. Maybe. But... <laughs> In case they don't, I want to, to dive into some background. So cool. first things first, let's start at the very beginning. You've been in theater off and on for a while, okay? How did you get your start in theater? Very interesting story. I was in um, a, a, a dance school, or uh, it's sort of like a local dance school in Williamsburg, and uh, they also had a little theater um, department in the school. And I saw a production of Taming of the Shrew. Now, I've always loved Shakespeare because of uh, um, I, school. I, I fell in love with, with Macbeth and, and um, just, just the language. But I saw this production of Taming of the Shrew. And these were kids that were all around. We were all around the same age. And I thought, this is something that I can do. I was a dancer prior to that okay. already. And I thought this was a natural progression from being a dancer, being a performer, to now not just not just using my body, but also using my voice. Mm -hmm. And I asked uh, the um, the artistic director of that department, I was like, I "Is it all right if if I audition for your for your next production?" And uh, and it was for Beauty and the Beast. Now the production was 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 uh, was never. Um, was never done, or, or rather, they, they 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 never put up the production because because of, of funding for the school, but the itch was there, mm -hmm. and it never and and I would say that, that those that was sort of the beginnings of of me thinking that this was a real possibility. Now, fast forward to to uh, Hunter College, where I was in their dance program, and I pulled my hamstring. Uh, when I when I was dancing out in the club, and so I I, I go to class, and, and the teacher says, uh, you know, what'd you do? And I said, like, well, I was battling somebody in the club, and he and 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 he said, this is the one thing that you shouldn't be doing, and he tells this to the whole class, you shouldn't be doing this, and um, and then I I uh, go to the doctor, and the doctor says, like, well, you know, it's gonna take months. Uh, and months for you to recover from this hamstring. Um, I mean, it was it was torn. It was a torn oh, hamstring. Not just a pull, but a yeah, tear. Yeah, yeah, it was it was an actual tear. And I thought, and prior to that, I thought that that I was going to be a choreographer and and a dancer, and and uh, and and that's really what I had my my sights set on. And and I thought like I can't dance for like about I don't know four, five, six months, like really w without without injuring myself any further. So uh, a friend of mine says, like, why, why don't you, why don't you um, go into uh, the Acting 101 class um, and um, uh, wh what do they call it when, when uh, you, uh, the word is escaping me right now, um, when you you don't uh, get a credit for a class, um, okay, uh, um, audit, audit, right? He's like, why don't you why don't you audit the acting one on one class? I was like, all right. Yeah, you know, was like, well, yeah. I'm I'm again. The itch was already there because of taming of the shoe, and mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, you know what? Perfect opportunity. Sure. Go into the class, and I can tell you that within the one month of being in that acting one on one class. I was in my first off-Broadway show, and I had my equity card. Wow! So when so so I have this this thing where I tell people when something is meant for you, it's meant for you, mm -hmm. and nothing can get in the way. And uh, I never looked back. You found your niche. I found my niche. That's awesome. And and it was because I pulled my hamstring. I, I ripped my hamstring. Right. Yeah. Had you not done that, you would have gone on to be a choreographer, choreographer probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. That was one heck of a dance-off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
you get into Broadway, you get off Broadway, and yeah. then then things go along, and your career expands and, and get, improves. Who have been your inspirations along the way? Hmm. Uh, Prince. <laughs> uh, Joel Gray. Uh, who else? In th- uh, definitely Raul Julia. Um, what was it about them that inspired you? I loved Cabaret, and I and I just love the 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 energy that he was projecting. And for me, but also uh, my my uh, exposure to musical theater, being born and raised in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, in seventies, eighties, uh, I didn't have access to 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 Broadway theater or, or, or a lot of theater, which is why, again, my, my, my first exposure to, to theater theater was was uh, Taming of the Shoe locally. Um, so for me, television and, and seeing these productions uh, that, that uh, have been um, turned into films, uh, West Side Story as well, and which, which I, I, I played the last time that I was mm-hmm. here, I played Tony because that's who I related with I, I, I related to Tony. I didn't relate to Bernardo, uh, mm-hmm. and and I and I thought like why why uh, must things be be so rigid? Why must I play that character just because I'm Latin? Um, so it was just the energy, Jill Ray, Raul Julia. It was it was uh, just the inspiration of him. You know, a man of, of La Mancha, knowing what he's done, and and uh, and also you know. Uh, being of Latin descent, uh, and and Prince because it's Prince, because like it's who, Prince. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Okay. Um, but I was I was really interested in being a performer. I, I I knew what what it was is that that it it made me realize and it made me accept the fact that I am an artist. Uh, and and I, and much to my my parents' chagrin. They wanted me to become a doctor, and I was very interested in biology. And I went to a a um, uh, a, a school uh, a, a a school where where I came out as a um, uh, a medical assistant, um, vocational school, uh, Mabel Dean Bacon, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I thought that that was a big possibility for me that mm-hmm. that uh, I was going to go from there and then then college and medical school and then do the whole spiel. I wasn't afraid of any of that. But uh, what what pulled me in the other direction was that it's it's the pull of the arts was my identity and and it was it was only until I would say my senior year in high school that I accepted the fact it was it was sort of a realization that I said like oh wow I'm an artist. And then I thought, oh, wow, I'm an artist. Yeah. <laughs> what am I going to do? And my parents weren't um, enthusiastic about it. They discouraged it. And it wasn't because they didn't think that I was talented, uh, that, that, that I wasn't talented. It, it wasn't that. It was because they they both came from the Dominican Republic mm-hmm. and and they see TV and they see the media and they didn't see a lot of people that looked like me. They didn't see a lot of people that looked like us. Mm-hmm. So they didn't want me to struggle. They, they, they thought that, you know, that the odds of me actually succeeding and it becoming my life where, where I'm able to make a living, very, very slim. Well, in the, that would have been the late 80s, right? Yes. And so there was a, a stigma against artists and their success pros- prospects out there. Yeah. So I, I understand that. I okay. Could, yeah. And, and yet you decided to continue forward with it. I, I, I would say that I didn't have a choice. I really, I didn't feel like I had a choice. I felt that, you know, it, it was, I had to come out as an artist and say like, this is who I am and I have to, and I have to go forward with that because um, anything else just won't do. I worked in hospitals and I worked in clinics and, and I was very good at it. Very, very good at it. There was no, I had no problems, you know, uh, you know maneuvering in the real world and, and, and doing these things. But the pull of the arts um, was, was so strong that um, it, it was the only way that I, that I felt normal. I, I, I didn't feel normal doing anything else except that. Like this, 
is, and it's also where I felt the most home, not the most home. I felt the safest also. Being on a stage for me, uh, at the times when, when, when I do teach, one thing that I love to tell my students is never be afraid of the stage uh, because the stage is the safest place in the world. Everything's planned mm -hmm. on a stage. There's a beginning, middle, and end. If you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. It's it, it, You're on a train, but just me, trust me that by the time you get to, to that last station, the ride's over. You get off. Real life is completely unpredictable. So... Um, stage is safe and and the family that you make uh on a stage and when you when you're in a production it's it's uh connections that you'll make for a lifetime so for me it wasn't a choice it was it was the only thing that um that made me feel whole as a human being and that made me feel that i can serve the world better as an artist than than being a doctor mm -hmm. i feel that healing um, also takes place on a stage as well, uh, through a stage, through a show. A lot of times I've heard people say that they are in a position where things aren't bad, nothing's broken, there's nothing wrong with it, but they just don't feel like they're being authentic. And what you're saying rings true to me because in theater, even though you're putting on personas, you're putting on hats, you're being different people, a lot of times that's when you're most your most authentic self. And so it sounds like you were drawn to that because, yes, being in the medical field, very noble profession, and you're helping people, and it sounds like you were pretty good at it, which is fantastic. But the theater brought you to your authentic self. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said for that. A lot of people go their whole lives without figuring out what that is, and you found that relatively young. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. All right. You mentioned seeing people on TV as uh, an example of acting out there. Now, you've had the opportunity hmm. to be on TV a few times. Uh, SVU comes to mind. Which yes. Is the show that everybody knows what SVU is. All right. How was that experience? It was my first TV show, and I felt also as well at home. I felt that this is something that I can do for the rest of my life. I love TV world. It's a grueling schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 12 hour days. But uh, as I like to say, it's it's a civilized schedule because it's five days a week. You still get weekends off. Whereas theater, it's six days a week and it's eight shows. Uh -huh. and, and that last day, it's, it's really th y your day off you don't really use that time to rest. You use that time to catch up. Mm -hmm. So for me, I loved being on a TV set. Uh, I loved working with Chris Maloney. I love w working with, with um, Mariska Haggerty. Uh, she is the sweetest person, and, and um, Maloney is such a professional, and he's so funny as well. Uh, and uh, just just being being around these seasoned actors because that because then I, I wanted to learn how natural they were even though that I mean I got I got the show uh, so apparently I did something right sure but a whole episode and 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 working with the stop and start uh, the st the stop and start kind of kind of uh, um, uh, pattern or rather rhythm of, of, of shooting and, and you know you're you're off for like about two three hours waiting for for um, uh, uh, for them to set up another scene and you have to, now I understand why why some certain people are are method actors because they they have to maintain that energy throughout the whole day in, in order to have the same energy every single time that they shoot them. So I, I, I learned how to, how to keep my energy up, not by, by being method, but, but uh, definitely how, uh, how, to, uh, how to focus and how to turn it on, turn it off. Um, because on the TV show, it's three seconds between this moment and this moment, but in real life filming, it might be five hours. It's, it's five hours. Yes, it is. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was, 
it was it was shocking actually how long you had to, I actually had to wait. I'm like, but I'm ready to go now. Mm-hmm. I'm ready to go now. Whereas in in theater, uh, it's it's again it's it's a train. It's like you get in, and there's no getting off until you get to the next stop, mm-hmm. which is the end of the show. Um, and with TV and film, it's it's uh, you know it's all right, all right, you know. You go really hard, really hard, and 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 actually, also, it's 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 not just you know a scene, and and then you know you, it's like a scene maybe a minute, and so you shoot shoot the scene for a minute. No, it's angles. It's it's a uh, you know, and then they have to reverse it on you. They 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 put the camera on you. Then then you have to do the same thing, and then they reverse the camera and they put it on that person. Then then have another angle. Then they have a master. Uh, it's it was my education on television filming and I want to do it forever. Okay. Uh, I love it. <laughs> okay. So SVU, this is where um, we're, we're not that far apart in age. It's been on for 25 years. Yeah. How does that feel? Season one. I'm very proud that I was part of season one. It feels fantastic. I, I would love to get on another episode as another character, uh, but um, I hear that. he wants uh, to be on another episode. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm very, very proud, very proud, and and uh, um, and I'm very thankful. Very cool. And you mentioned uh, Mariska and Christopher, mm-hmm. and and how great they were to work with. Um, being green and been being with seasoned actors. Did you learn skills that you could take with you other places? And if so, what were they? Um, I learned how to focus and, and maintain focus by watching how they, they, they um, again, how, how they were able to turn it on and turn it off. Um, I, I in, in that particular episode, I, I, just, I just remember being, being so focused and and <laughs> focused in between scenes and, and trying to stay within character words you know they were talking about like uh you know going to LA and and uh, um why you know, I think Chris at that time lived in Los Angeles mm-hmm. um and he was saying like oh yeah I prefer to live in Los Angeles and and, and all these casual conversations and here I am you know um white knuckling it <laughs> And, and thinking like, no, I have to stay focused. I have to stay focused. Um, so they showed me the ease of of being able to also. There's a, a very important aspect of it is that you have to also relax, in in order to be good at what you do. Otherwise, um, you will come off as really rigid when you're actually doing scenes. And so that results in multiple takes. Mm-hmm. Because you didn't relax, <laughs> and be, and be, and because you're 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 so determined to get it right. And I remember once, like uh, uh, there was one scene which, where it was I was just trying to figure out, uh, and and we were doing multiple multiple takes. And Chris was like, Chris looked at me. He was like, he was like, well, relax, <laughs> relax. So I learned to relax in front of a camera, uh, and. Uh, it's it's something that I've that I've carried with me ever since. That ever since I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten. I, I never forget. You know, Chris in the back of my head saying like, "Wilson, relax." Nice. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you're on stage in a theater, I- it's very large, right? There's yeah. a little bit of forgiveness with your body language, with your facial expressions. But I imagine on camera, when it is on you, there's no wiggle room. No. It's all there. The camera, the difference between camera and stage is that the the camera, all you have to do is move your eyes slightly in a certain direction and it completely, completely exposes you. Mm-hmm. Whatever's going on in your head, whatever's going on in your head, if it happens at that moment, camera picks it up. The stage will not pick that up. No one in the audience will, will ever see if if you just all of a sudden had another thought like, "Oh, my cat," you know, <laughs> you know, they won't see that. But on, be it film or television, you have to be so clear about what's going on in your head. It's it's 
And from, I, I learned from a, uh, another friend of mine uh, where he said, like, you know what, the words are for, for television aren't so uh, aren't as important as, 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 I mean, as in the sense of getting every single word right. He's like, they're not as important as what's going on inside your head because that's what the camera picks up. He's like, don't focus, don't focus on just trying to be and saying the words and acting as if though you're on stage. The stage, the words are so important because you ha because that's what the audience is picking up all the way at, at the very last seat and balcony. But when it comes to film and television, he's like, what what's cool, what's what you're processing in your head, that's what the camera is picking up. Um, which is why uh you know, silent films went, uh, were were uh, it w was 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 a medium. Um, I, I, I right now I'm, I'm just thinking of Charlie Chaplin and mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and Buster Keaton, and and you know the emotions that that they expressed with without a, without any words um, because of what was going on in their head and they, it's the intention in your head that the camera picks up. You can be saying anything. <laughs> But if you're thinking something else, the camera's going to pick that up. So much yeah. of our communication is through body language. Yeah. And so much of our body language is from here up. Yes. And it, it really comes into play with yeah. the quirk of an eyebrow or, you know, mm -hmm. the sideways look or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, and, and, and last thing about that is, is uh, th there was um, a, a teacher that I was studying with not that long ago where, and, and, I, and I gesticulate just because, again, I'm from Brooklyn, so... That's what we do. Um, she she said, "I want you to take all that energy and everything that you do, um, and just put it in your eyes." <laughs> she, she's like, "Don't move. Take all that energy and all that intention and all that movement, and just put it in your eyes." She's like, "And that's how you get booked for TV." And shortly and shortly after, like two lessons with her, I booked the show Banshee. Okay. Yeah, so it works. It works. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so let's fast forward a little bit. That yes. was that was twenty five years ago. Mm -hmm. More recently, you were in Tick Tick Boom. Yes. All right. <laughs> Tell me about that experience. Well, what was weird about that is that we were in the middle of a pandemic. Still, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean it, it, uh, the the COVID pandemic really hasn't completely gone away. We're still worried about, it, but but we're not locked down like we uh, like we were before. But that's what was strange about it is is uh, the whole process because I've been on sets before, um, and this set was different because everyone was separated uh, at, by age. Actually, all the older because because COVID um, was was uh, taking the lives of older people. Um, everyone that you saw in that film in that famous in that famous uh, diner scene. Anyone that was older, like you know Joel Gray, uh, Cheetah Rivera, um, etc., um, we were all separated. We were not allowed to be uh, in the same area. We were in a huge hangar when we shot that, and we were all masked. And and uh, Anthony, um, not Anthony, um, Adam, Daphne, and I, we were all in our own little pod, and and. We were only allowed to to associate and talk to each other and, and, and touch each other. Everyone was completely completely separate. So that's what was odd. Again, a movie magic. But, right, but, that's wild. Then. And when they edited everything together, it made it seem like we were all in the same place. So they they took they shot everyone completely separately, completely completely. Yeah, yeah, we were not in the same area. I mean, we, we were, it was the same set, but they would shoot them first and they would shoot us and then they would just composite, you know, do a composite and then put us all together. You'd never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I know. Okay. And, 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 so, and so that's what was interesting about that. It was not like your average, you know, film where, where you're, you know, you're chatting with people in between scenes and you're hanging out in other people's trailers and, and so forth. Not, none of that was going on. Everyone was completely isolated in their own separate little group you know even like like uh, speaking to to Lin Manuel um, and and chatting with him like we we were even then like there was a certain distance that we we had to speak to him um, and uh, you know and I mean I've 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 known Lin 
I knew Lynn since since uh, in the Heights, since way back in the day, because we uh, we share the same producers, um, same producer. They, they rent also. They also produced in the Heights, and so that's how we got. That's how I got. I got to know uh, Lynn back mm-hmm. in the day. I mean, I, I was there for the opening of, of of in the Heights. I was there for the Tony. So we we, we knew each other then. We knew in a lot of the same circles. Yeah, it's a lot of the same circles, yeah. right? Um, and uh, so for me, it, it wasn't. It wasn't like uh, I was like, oh, what was it? It's Lynn and the whole thing. It was like, it was like, hey, what's up? <laughs> How's it going? But from a distance. Uh, hey, what's yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but we, but we were we were you know we were told what to do uh, and and we did it. But it was it was just you know we did everything in bubbles. Was it, it surreal? <laughs> yeah, it was very surreal. And but, but wait, what was more surreal is actually when we saw the final product. It was like wow, you would think that all of us were in the same area. <laughs> we're all of us doing it at the same time. It took days. It took days to put to, to put all that together. I imagine yeah. so. Post production must have been a nightmare for that one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And and then after that, to to be brought in to do the vocals, um, again everything in a bubble, uh, and um, but it was uh, it was kind of nice to see you know the people that 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 you've uh, idolized for years um, uh, at a distance. You know, yeah. like Bernadette Peters was like, "Hey, how you doing?" And I was like, "Oh, this person that was like, oh, I was like, oh, I love this person," but we're not allowed, you know, to speak or even get close to each other uh, at all. So it was, it was, it was a lot of fun, um, but because uh, working is always fun, and, and just being and with that kind of creative energy is always fun. Mm-hmm. But um, it was weird. It was it was very weird, yeah. Uh, because it was because it was again it was COVID. It was it was like the peak actually the peak of COVID. It, it was still it was still all happening and, and it was a uh, scary time. There were a lot of uncertainties, yeah. a lot of a lot of fear at yeah. the time because the world was on fire, and uh, and you were still working, you know, still still making the magic happen just from a distance. Mm, yeah, and again feeling i felt very very lucky still feel very lucky very blessed that that uh, even during that time i was i was still working uh just you know doing doing what i was meant to do and again more the more things like that happen the more i think like i'm in the right place i'm still i'm still on the right path you know so the opportunity comes and yeah. it's still working that's yeah. good yeah uh-huh. Okay, so now let's address the elephant in the room. Ah! Okay? <laughs> uh, the big one. You are a Tony Award winner. What? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. So, you were in a show called Rent back in the 90s. I heard about that. Yeah. 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 I remember <laughs> jamming to the soundtrack back in the 90s. So, this is a little surreal for me, too. But um, tell me about the whole experience of, of being in Rent, which became a phenomenon and ultimately led to you being a Tony Award winner. Wow. How do I put this in a nutshell? It's yeah, gonna, that's a big question. It's, it's going to be a big nut shell. <laughs> <laughs> so let's first start out by, by establishing that I was 23 when this happened. When uh, And I wasn't sure... Well, even further back, I never studied musical theater. I I studied theater, and I studied dance, and I was self-taught singer. Really? Prior to that, I was self-taught. So I I never uh, had designs on being on Broadway for musical theater at all. I didn't think that was going to be my life because I didn't see anyone that looked like me on Broadway. There wasn't anyone that inspired me, that made me go like I want to do that. Um, there was, you know, there was Cats. There, I don't know what was going on at that time. Again, didn't have a lot of exposure to musical theater, so that that wasn't my thing. Uh, so that that wasn't something that I that I planned and worked on and 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 uh, and and practice on being or rather just that, that wasn't my life so so when and, and I and I say this to 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 set the stage of of uh, when the audition of rent was was um, proposed to me uh, um, my the, the late agent um, 
Fritz Collister, God rest his soul. He uh, said, like, you know, there's this, there's this audition for, for the show. It, it did really well, uh, this, this reading of, for this musical. And, I, and again, immediately, the moment he said musical, it was like, musical? I don't want to do music. It was like, I don't want to do musicals. It's like, do I, it was like, I, do I look like I, like I, I, I can do musicals? Like, this is not me. But he's like, no, no, no. He's like, this, this will be great. You, you should go in. Now, I was working a job. Um, it wasn't 9 to 5. It was actually 12 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock in the morning. And it really doesn't matter what I was, <laughs> what the specific of the job is. Like basically, just know that this is what I was doing. I, I, I was doing this already for months. Um, so this is like the overnight yeah. Midnight to nine a.m. Yeah, night shift. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This nice. was a night shift, and this this that wasn't the all the the whole five days. Well, actually, whole five. It's all depending also because it was it, it possibly could have been a seven uh, a day a week job depending on who was doing the shift. Um, I basically I was working for a complaint center for for uh, a um, uh, uh, property management company. So. You know, uh, if, if something happens at two o'clock in the morning in one of their properties where where everything's getting backed up and it's destroying everything around the property, I called their in-house um, in-house crew. They had in-house plumbing, the whole thing. I called them up. You say, "Hey, emergency!" I'm the guy that you called in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, so this is what I did. Uh, it was it's uh, it's my my dad worked in this company as a superintendent, and so like he hooked me up. He's like he's like in the meantime while you're trying to. <laughs> you do your art thing. Um, he's like, why don't you do this? You to pay the bills. So, yes. And I was like, all right, I'm paying the bills. So I was doing that. And so uh, the, the, uh, for the, the first audition, um, and mind you also, and it, for, those, for those people who, who are familiar with, or, or who are uh, familiar with musical theater or in musical theater, everyone knows that, you know, uh, you always have to have your book. Your book of music. I did not have a book because, again, I wasn't aiming for musical theater. Pay attention to what I'm saying because this is going to be really funny. What, what song I brought in? Um, so, um, so first day, first day for the audition. Um, I come home from work nine o'clock in the morning. I drive home. Uh, I take a shower. I eat some food and I'm thinking like, oh, my audition isn't until this particular time. Let me take a nap, a quick, like quick 30 minute nap. What happens? I wake up in the afternoon because I was, <laughs> I was up all night and I go, oh my God, my agent calls me and he tears into me. You don't know what it took me to get, uh, to get you this audition. I can get you the audition tomorrow again. He was like, you can go in tomorrow again, um, but you better apologize to everybody there. Um, it's really unprofessional. I go, listen, I'm, I'm, I actually have a job, job now, and 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 um, in my head, it was thinking, but I don't really, I don't really care if I get it or not. It was like, this is, what, is, what are they going to give me that I don't already have? I already have a little bit of job security. Um, I have medical insurance. Um, you said for that, yeah, and. Uh, I was like, fine. I was like, oh, you, you bloody musical. Fine, 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 fine. I'll go. So next day, <laughs> so again, same schedule though. Same same work schedule, 12 to 9. So instead of falling asleep, you know, I do the same thing. I take a shower, eat, stay awake. Go caffeinate. To the, caffeinate, go to the audition. Um, I have on um, uh, overalls combat boots I have a little goatee um, and uh, I you know I, I I show up there the audition and and Michael Greif is there and Bernie Telsey is there uh, casting director and uh, and Martha Banta as well is their assistant director and I start out my audition by saying I want to apologize and I, and I start to spiel this is what I do, blah, blah, blah. I have this job, so forth. And from behind me, I hear a voice says, like, don't feel bad. I work, I, I, I work a night job, too. And who is it? It's Jonathan Larson. Comes from behind me. He's like, I wasn't here yesterday, either. <laughs> 
he's like, because I had to work, and he sat down in front of me. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So I go like, cool. Again, it. I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't have any nerves uh, about any of it, because already by this point in my life, I've already performed it in front of a lot. I've been. Uh, to Brazil and performed in front of thousands of people as a backup dancer and, and, and a backup dancer for for local groups in, in in New York City. I've been doing this like for a long time, so me, so me it was like no sweat, um, whatever. I'm not gonna get the musical anyway. Again, this is my head. It was like I'm not gonna get it. Uh, it doesn't. Why I, worry I, about it if it's not gonna happen? Right, and it doesn't matter to me. I'm just making I'm making Fritz happy, <laughs> you know, so that way I can get him off my back. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you ready, folks? Usually when when uh, I, I get like so what 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 you think for your audition song? Great balls of fire. Because they said rock, right? And I was like, and 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 wait, and I said that I didn't have a book because it's the only sheet piece of sheet mu- music that I had that I used that that I that I bought back in when when Colony when when Colony still existed, uh, where they it was all sheet music. Mm-hmm. Um, I got that piece of music because I was auditioning for Rocky Horror uh, Picture Show. Uh, I went in there trying to sing in acapella. I got kicked out of the room um, by the director. He says, like, you were professionals here. I don't know what, what you think that you can sing acapella here. I, I went to Colony, got the sheet music, barged, literally barged right back in, said, like, all right, you're going to hear me out now. And I sang Great Balls of Fire. They, pl- they applauded me for having the balls to walk back, in, for being kicked out and walking back in. I was like, I'm from Brooklyn, man. He was like, no one does that to me. He was like, I'm going to do my thing. And I told you that I can sing, and I wanted you to hear me sing. Um, so that, that's, and that's the, the, the story of that sheet music. So it was like, um, I kept it. Because I didn't know when I was going to use it again, so mm-hmm. that's what I used yeah. as my audition song, and, and "Great Balls of Fire." And then uh, uh, um, uh, Tim Weil, the musical director, said, "Like, do you have anything else?" I was like, "No, that's it," because I didn't care again. I was like, "No, that's it." I mean, the, the, he's like, "What? What other thing do you need?" I was like, "I can't Check read music." He's like, um, "I was like, how about Amazing Grace?" Um, and so he he played Amazing Grace, uh, and then and then he then. He played it up a key, and then he played it uh, higher key. He was like, let's see how high you can go. Um, I also didn't know w- what kind of singer I was. <laughs> I didn't know whether I was a tenor or baritone or whatever. It was like, oh, 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 oh. right, exactly. It was like, I just I just sing. sing. Tell me what to sing, I'll sing it for you. Um, so he was like, all right, all right, cool. Um, and then I was like, all right, we're, we're done. I looked around and was like, we're done? Cool. Uh, <laughs> we're done. And I, I stood and I, I started to walk out, and they said, "Stop." And I was like, "Oh, what now?" <laughs> because I'm tired. By this point, you have to understand. Well, you- I haven't slept yet. <laughs> I still haven't slept from twelve o'clock midnight the night. So you're the, going on at what? Eight s- hours? I, Twenty hours? I'm just steam is left. That's that's all that's left. And I'm like, "What now?" <laughs> like I need to get home and I need to fall asleep. I need to eat, fall asleep, cause I got another. I got a shift, you know. Oh, I got a shift at twelve, and I, I love need the fact <laughs> what you're worried about. Jonathan Larson is sitting in front of you. You're at an audition for a show, and you're. I worried. know. I gotta get home, and go to sleep, uh-huh. so I can answer some phones. Yeah, that's yeah. That's that's it. That that was my priority, right? So, so. They they say like can you they go like here's here's a cassette um, here's here's uh, the script can you learn this by tomorrow and uh, mind you also by the way also on top of that I was a smoker too like I was a pack a day smoker it was like yeah I'm thinking in my head we're like ah sure like whatever and we're like all right fine it was like oh and and, and again me for when they gave me the, for one I, well, actually I was surprised I was like what. You actually liked what I just did. <laughs> I was for sure. I, I was positive that, that you guys would just go like, "All right, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Goodbye." I'm like, oh, okay. So, get the cassette and, and grab the script, and I was like, "All right, cool." I put it in my bag. Um, I, when I uh, when I wake up, I, I wake up like around like uh, nine o'clock. Get ready, eat some dinner, go. 
then uh, the great thing about, about that shift is I'm the only one in the office. There's absolutely no one there. Uh, so uh, I, I put the, the cassette in. For those people that that don't know what that is, uh, it's it's what we used to use to listen to music back back, <laughs> back in the day, uh, and and I play and I play it. I play the whole and it's Jonathan uh, singing the whole demo, singing the whole show, the whole demo. And and I had fast forward to to uh, today for you and and cover you. And the songs were uh, cover you and today for you. Mm-hmm. The first time that I hear. Um, rent when I hear light my candle all of a sudden all of a sudden I thought oh my god I have to be in this I get chills just talking about it because it was really it, it changed it changed my whole perspective and I thought this man writes like I'm included in this world. I see myself in this world. I've never, like, seven brides, seven brothers? No. Cats? No. Not even Greece? No. None of that. All of a sudden, I immediately, immediately I knew this is something that has never been heard before, and I have to be part of this. So you went within 24 hours mm-hmm. from being, oh, crap, I've got to go do this thing to check this box off to make my, my agent get off my back to realizing that this was something, this was big, and that you need to be part of it. That, that's huge. Yeah. It, it, it changed my life. Uh, uh, but all of a sudden, I had skin in the game. Mm-hmm. And then... That's when I got nervous all of a sudden. (laughs) It matters. Because then I had to learn Cover You. And Cover You, I don't know whether any, uh, again, well, for anyone out there that that has attempted to sing this song, you have to mix that song in your voice. I've been in two rock bands prior to that. I didn't know how to mix. I knew how to yell Mm. on key. So... I, I, it was a challenge for me to to learn that song, and and I thought like I'm gonna mess this up. I'm gonna mess this up. I really need to do this. Every today for you was easy for me because it was um, it was more kind of like rappy, uh, and that and then there was today for you, tomorrow for me, but also even that voice, still still um, I didn't then discover that voice really until the very next day, so. Next day, so same wait, wait, thing. Wait, wait. Uh-huh. So we're, we're, I'm just trying to paint this picture uh-huh. here. So you're there, three o'clock in the morning, smoking. Ci- by the way, again, smoking cigarettes, <laughs> smoking cigarettes, learning this song. With the phone right there in case somebody has, mm-hmm. you know, a backed up toilet or mm-hmm. something, and you're just jamming out, trying to feel your way through this intensely high song. Yeah. And learning it as you go, knowing that mm-hmm. you have an audition to potentially get this part in, you know. A few hours. Right. No stress. Yeah. No pressure. No stress, no pressure, no sleep. Yeah. You know, no sleep till broken, as they say. So, uh, you know, go through the same routine, get uh, drive home, take a shower, eat uh, coffee, cigarettes, go to the audition. And I was like, all right, here, here I go. Um, I got to show them what I learned and see if I, I learned it well. Um, thank God for the musical director, Tim Weil, because what we had was not an audition. We had a work session. I've never been, rarely have I have been to auditions where, where it turns into a work session. Um, but Tim Weil was working with me as we first like the first notes for Cover You. Um, he's like, hmm. He's like, I, he's like, I could, and he, it, it's really a testament to how good of a musical director he is. He, he heard a quality in my voice, and he said, like, 
and and, and he he took a, a gamble that that I'm that I was a fast learner. So he said, "Here I am, um, hitting that hitting you know uh, live in my house just dead on. Live in my house, I'll be a shelter." Which and and that's obviously not the voice that people know right sure. now as as Angel. He's like. I just pay me back with 1,000 kisses. I'm just hitting it dead on. Uh, and he's like, hold on. He's like, I hear a Stevie Wonder kind of quality. A, a, um, he's like a, a, a young Stevie Wonder uh, quality about your voice. He's like, think about that. Um, the, the, the kid Stevie Wonder. He's like, I don't want to offend you. But he's like, that's, that's what I hear. He's like, try that he's like and and try the beginning of song that way so it went from live in my house it then to live in my house i'll be it was more seeming i'll be a shelter and he's like exactly he's like there he's like where he's like wherever that the first person that ever taught me placement was tim Weil. and and we went through the whole song uh, and uh, all over, I'll cover you, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it, so we stumbled through the whole song, and and Tim was very pleased, and 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 um, I wasn't looking. By that point, I wasn't looking at anyone. I was just kind of like, you know, intently working on 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 this this session, and I'm more because I was learning. I was like, I'm learning how to do stuff. Like I, I never even knew my voice can do this, and not just by by cueing me mentally about what what to do. All of a sudden, like my throat um, vocal cords knew what to do, uh, and then and then he was and they went like, great. And then Michael says like, ah, okay, now um, we're just gonna play a beat, like you know hitting the table. He was like, we're going to do, we're going to do a, a little bit of today for you. And then we started to do that. He was like, we're going to dance a little bit. Now, again, I was a club kid. And so that was like my wheelhouse, my wheelhouse. Was that. And I danced and they were like, hi, everyone's laughing and all that. It was like, oh, thank you very much. And then, and then Michael, as I'm out the door, Michael says like, you do know that this is drag though, right? And I said like, yeah, well, it's been one of my dreams to actually play drag. Um, Complete lie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, as I was it walking out, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and uh, but but for me it was like the, the reason I said that really it was the, the intention is like as, as in I'll do anything like really like like I can relate I relate to this character um, because I was a club kid because the the motley crew that's represented in uh, that's represented in in this show they were my friends. These are the people that I used to club with, you know, all those different colors and 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 uh, sexual orientations and 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 artists and and, and bo bo bohemian mentality. This is what I lived prior to you know you know being straight list and, and working working at this this night job. That's what I did. This is what what I was a regular. So so. Um, I'm thinking like, uh, all right, I'm done with this audition. I, I take the train, um, ask your place, take the six train, ask your place, go home, uh, and then take the L train. And and uh, as I'm walking down, as I get off Laura Street, thinking, I suck, I suck, <laughs> I suck, I suck. Why do I do this? I don't even know why I bother doing this, and I walk. Man, mind you, I'm like exhausted. Finally, like the fatigue is finally hitting me in the sleep, and I I get home. I take off my clothes. I get into bed, and I crawl. It was it's, and I remember it was a Friday. I crawl into bed. I and and I curl into a ball. And I go like I don't even know why I bother doing this. It's just I've, I've been doing this for so many years. I should just quit. At least I have a job, right? So life continues on that way for the next week. I don't hear from them. Um, and I call the agency. I go, like, whatever happened to um, that, that rent thing that, that I auditioned for? And uh, Anne Wright said, oh, they loved you. Um, you start work next week. Wait, what? Yeah. And I go, why, why, why didn't you tell me? She's like, yeah, I was just about to call you and let you know that that um, they loved you. They they want you for the, for for the show. I go, oh oh, and 
you know, want to know what the funny thing about that is? I thought, how am I going to do this job and that job at the same time? Because rent was only slated to be off Broadway for a month. Got you that. feel me? Yeah, so you got to see that <laughs> gig with your life or your health insurance. Right, and else. right. I'm feeling like so. Yes, folks. I still wasn't sure. I, I was, yeah. I was, I was like, yeah, it sounds really great, but now I, I have to quit this job, and I don't think they'll take me back. Being an adult can be hard sometimes when you've got these big decisions to make. Yes, yes. Uh, and mm. so I tell Fritz. I was like, I don't know, and I and I and I, I explained to him what my dilemma was, or what I felt was a dilemma, and then um, uh, my mentor, um, who was the one who first referred me to to Fritz, um, he calls me up and he's furious with me, and uh, and 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 he says. And and I don't have to go through the whole conversation, at all, because it all it all boiled down to this one question. Uh, Mark Amiton. He asked me, "Are you a dispatcher, or are you an actor?" I said, Damn it! Why'd you have to ask it that way? I mean, it's a simple question, but it's a simple. It's a question. Yeah, it was a simple question, and. And it went, it goes all the way back to how we started this 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 interview. I know what I am, mm -hmm. and I had to answer to my authentic self and say, "I'm an actor. Yeah, um, I'll take the show. Yes, I'll, I'll do it." Now, for the first couple of weeks, I was juggling both. And I was running on empty for two weeks um, before yes. before Christmas break. I remember that the, the the rehearsals where I was kind of behind everybody else. Why? Because I'd show up like a zombie. Past uh, they were like oh, and and he was and Michael was trying to work around my schedule. I was trying to keep both jobs. I was trying to keep both. And on New Year's Eve. My my uh, my supervisor um, on the phone was was telling me, um, well, well, you're coming in tomorrow, New Year's Day. You're coming in tomorrow uh, for the morning shift, right? I'm like, that's not my shift. I'm I'm not coming in. This this is my shift. I, that particular night, I was working from four to twelve. I was like, um, no, I'm going home, and and then I'm doing my regular shift at, from four from four to to 12 uh and uh he's like no 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 i have you i have you written down for whatever he fires me long story short he fires me that night over the phone he's drunk at a, at a new year's party and and meanwhile i'm also i'm also uh um I'm sitting on grenades because at that particular time, for some reason, it was it was po you, and you can go go to the almanac and, and and on that particular that particular year, there was torrential rain happening and it was flooding, a lot of the properties and 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 I was getting calls. It was one of those nights where I was getting calls from every bloody tenant and then discovered that it was a city problem and so i had to call this and so i'm like doing do, doing all this and then and then now and now he's telling me like and and you're coming in tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning i was like no i'm not and i go it's not my shift and so it was like so it was like you're doing this because you want to be you, you want to drink all night and you don't want to and you don't want to take my shit. It was like you know what I, I he's like well then uh, I don't want to do this but it was like well do what you need to do but but um, I I'm not gonna do it and I'm I'm not gonna be abused that way, so I get home after uh, with the news w to my parents that that I just got fired from the job. <laughs> Tell my dad was like I well m meanwhile again my dad is 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 uh, seniority he's worked for this company as well. Uh, for a long, long time. And I also warned my supervisor was that you don't want to do this. By the way, it, it's 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 going to come back to you in a way that you're not going to like. Um, he's like, no, I don't care. Was, you're fired. I was like, okay, all right. And I don't and say I didn't warn you. And I told my father, yeah, I, I got fired. And he 
I expected something else from him. I, I, I didn't expect the reaction that I got from him. He said, it's going to be a great year for you. And that was 1995 to 1990. And, and as ball dropped, 1996, friends, 1996. And oh, what a good year that was. Now, to finish off the nutshell, because I don't want to bore everyone with all the details, that allowed me the freedom to go headlong into the rehearsals with the rent completely. It was one of the best things that has ever happened to me. Um, it allowed me to completely untether and have faith in the universe that this is what I was meant to be doing. And, and um, I went headlong into that character and, and headlong into the rehearsals and put everything, and it was an education in musical theater because I also... Again, mo all my my uh, experience in edu and and also in education and, and uh, it, it, as far as theater is is always either straight theater or me as a dancer, but never together. And so, I had to learn how to connect uh, logically, you know, the the idea of like uh, talking and then all of a sudden breaking out into song. I've seen it, like, again, I've seen it in films and all that, but, mm -hmm. but actually doing it myself and, and having that in my body. And also, I remember Michael, throughout dance rehearsals uh, for Today For You and, and other stuff, he, was, he had to remind me to smile because I was used to battling at in clubs, and so I never smiled when I danced. I was dead serious at beating the person that I was battling. He's like, he's like, you need to smile. It was like, oh, and he's like, and you need to look at the audience a little bit. <laughs> so I, I say this candidly because it was it was a great education, and it changed my life perspective on the world and the way everything worked, and 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 um, the freedom. Uh, to completely trust myself and trust others, uh, and uh, and you know, to say the least, the 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 um, it's safe to say now. After I've I, I've I've told everyone the story up to this point, that the Tony was the last thing that I thought of. I was I was I was just thinking of like I want to get this right, and and so every night was 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 about improving and improving and getting and and uh, uh, finding little moments that 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 I didn't find the night before or or, or expanding on that and and uh, you know uh, and Jesse Martin uh, L Martin made it easy because he's such a great actor and and he and, and it really helped that that he and I immediately trusted each other one night um, said like listen we're gonna be have to be kissing each other on stage just go out for a drink and literally it was just one drink we chatted and it was like I trust you implicitly completely and everything that you do I'll follow anything uh, he's like anything you do I'll follow he's like go with it and that complete and that and that for me was like oh, I'm good. Um, and and then Jonathan dying uh, after that, it 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 um, if anything it galvanized us even tighter, all of us, and it made it even all the more a serious thing and and an important essential thing that we needed to do in carrying on his message, knowing how important how how important this work is still, um, and and uh, what what it means for the world at large uh and and uh, uh you know especially if you think about like where we are now it, it's, it's sort of like it's the beginnings and i know that that uh, the, the um, lgbtq ai rights um have gone on for forever but um it really started more of a conversation um, even more of a conversation where, where, where it actually healed people. Relationships were being created because of this show. People's minds were being changed. Uh, um, conversations about, uh, about um, AIDS, HIV, uh, HIV AIDS were, 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 in, were in the forefront. Um, it, wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just a show. It was a movement. It was activism. Mm -hmm. And we knew it. And we knew that 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 we had to um, we had to take care of that baby. 
even more so after he passed because it was incomplete when he died in the sense that that there would have been more space for him to to, to tool around for for um, for act two but we filled in the gaps the the, the where where things were th where things were uh, I guess we're, we're, we're most likely he would have maybe done a couple of rewrites or here and there, but we but it was frozen at that point, and so we did it, and uh, it it was for me it was I had to grow up. All of us had to grow up very very quickly. And now, mind you, folks, I'm 24 years old, just a snot nosed kid, you Damn know. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then all of to be hit with a Tony, I'm like. I'm just, and, and it wasn't I know people say that it was oh it was just nice to be nominated but for, for me it was it was it was like you know um I'm just really glad to be doing all that this is cream this is fantastic the Tony doesn't change what I do on stage when I knew and, and remember people talking about like um when, when the certain uh, 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 certain people from from the the, the um, theater wing um, Tony committee that would come and, and they were like, oh, you know, there's some some people out there that, that are going to vote for the Tonys out there and, and go, you know, make sure that you really do well. It was like, I do well every night. I don't care who's in, f I don't care who's in the audience. For me, I'm doing it, I'm doing it for the, for, for everyone that's out there, not specifically for one person, even though I, I and I love Prince, this is the reason I mentioned it. Prince came to see the show, it was like, um, and it's really hard to ignore him because he was wearing bright pink um, and he was sitting in the aisle and there were some times where people were like, you know, I'm really nervous. It was like, you know what, I'm doing, this, I'm going to do the show for Prince the same way that I did the show for everybody else that I've been doing for the last four, five, six, seven months. It's like, I'm going to keep on doing my show with that. That's why I do it. It was fantastic. Now I, and, and, and but, but, but I loved the, the fact that, that, uh, you know, the Tony just opened up the world for me and 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 uh for lack of a better uh word it it, it made me feel le legitimate finally that all the struggles and everything that i that i've been going through uh prior to that it it, it finally it bore fruit and i was able to look at my parents and go like you see and my parents, they prior prior to that, when I decided that that I was going to be an actor and and go headlong into performing arts, they said, "You are on your own then." And and I said, "Watch me." So uh, I'm very very proud to say that everything that I have gotten and that I have done within the arts is thanks to my parents because they told me go get it yourself and when you and when you get it you can say it's yours it's mine it's completely completely mine it was sort of like reverse encouragement from them you know but they said like that's the way you do it because they came from nothing from Dom to, from Dominican Republic and said that's the way we do it that's the way you're going to do it um and rent just you know, cemented that for me. It was like, yes. And it was yet another sign from the universe that said like, you're in the right place. You're, you're meant, you're, you're, you're doing what you're meant to be doing and, and, uh, keep on doing it. And, uh, and it's been the gift that has kept on giving. <laughs> it's funny when you look back in retrospect and you say, okay, if I hadn't have been at that club that night trying to do that dance off and tore my hamstring, and then if I hadn't have gotten the advice to audit that theater class, and then if I hadn't have gotten that call for that job, and, and maybe, you know, if you hadn't overslept that one day, it would have turned out differently because Jonathan Larson wouldn't have been there, yeah. right? Yeah. So a long nap. And if you hadn't, if all of those hadn't have... <laughs> It turned out just more different. It might have turned out completely different. Yeah. It's funny how things work out. Gives me chills. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so now we've established how we got here. <laughs> now you are here. Yeah. And you're working with ACT, and, and we're very happy to have you here. And you are in our production of American Idiot. Yeah. Okay. It's a very exciting show. So tell me about the show American Idiot. Um, I can definitely make a um, 
smaller nutshell um, description of the show. Okay. Um, uh, American Idiot. Um, well, I relate to it also because it, it it definitely has that sort of Generation X kind of kind of feeling mentality kind of angst. It's it's um, uh, a show that happens like right around right around nine eleven. Um, when I asked uh, Robbie, our director, Robbie Soto, I was like, well, you know, what what time really do you want it to be in? Um, and 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 uh, he's like, yeah, he's like he's like. 9-11, like right around that time, which motivates these three characters, these three friends, Johnny, um, uh, Tony, and Mike. And uh, they, uh, suburbanites, they they uh, are disillusioned with the world, disillusioned with their the suburban um, uh, world and, and uh, rather, life, and, and they uh, are... Um... um Resentful, resentful of of the the lies, what they perceive as what the government has 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 promised and told them, and 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 the promise of of you know equality and freedom and, and all that they 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 don't want, they they resent the box that they're being uh, that they feel that the world is trying to put them in, and so they they um it's a huge it's really a coming of age story, and so they decide. You know, to all pursue their idealized version of of uh, of what their future should be, of what their success and and life is, and so they all they they and they all branch out in different directions. One, um, but but what happens, and without getting it, it, even into specifics, what happens is really what they find is that the disillusion disillusionment really is within themselves, um, and and they fall into their own little pitfalls. Um, and they they come full circle back where they came from, and and they find uh, that they definitely have grown, but that they are also responsible for their for their own future, and they also have to be responsible for the change in the world that 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 they're complaining about, <laughs> which is very angsty. Um, but uh, but all of that set within the backdrop of good old fashioned punk music. I, I would say like like punk music that punk music that is um, uh, ready made for public consumption that it isn't you know it, it isn't like the Stooges uh, it isn't it it isn't like the Germs <laughs> it isn't it isn't like um, uh, the Sex Pistols it's it's I would say it's sort of commercialized what people would say commercialized but but it's I would say it's it's the best punk music set to the 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 uh, the stage of of a rock opera that I've ever heard and I and you know and and Tommy's great and and um, I can't think of any uh, in my top of my head but but the first one that I think of was like for rock opera is Tommy um, some of the best music and some of the best storytelling within these short songs uh, and and you just get to see these these people like struggle through their their lives in a very short amount of time, but it's it's all very very clear, and it it um, it describes what people are still going through now. You know, uh, the the great thing is that 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 these three characters are all doing different things. My character specifically falls into drug abuse, um, his own particular demons, and 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 fights with this alter ego. As a representative of, of, of his drug abuse, but really, it's it's just a, a representation of of him getting in his own way and being afraid of love, and getting a, a, a afraid of responsibility. And actually, all of these guys are all trying to uh, trying to figure out like what it is to be an adult, what it is to grow up, and 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 do all that, and what it and and uh, what it's what it's like to to do the things that it's necessary in order to be adult and say like I have arrived, and and also discovered like you know that they, they discovered that th there is no end point really it's 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 all you all continue to continue to to grow um but as long as you realize that you're responsible for it um but you have to get out of your own way um and you know uh, even 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 without getting into drug abuse or alcoholism or um, going into the army and blowing your leg off and 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 being that I, I uh, you know being having that kind of idealism um, 
um, just every day of being reminded of like we need to get out of our own ways if 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 uh, we want to accomplish whatever it is if we're gonna move ahead if we're gonna move ahead in the world and and uh, that's the best way to describe the show okay I mean yet again you find yourself in a show that has a very powerful message a very personal message yeah. and yet a message that applies to the world at large yeah as well um, with your character how do you identify with this character? How, how much of Wilson is included in this character? Um, the rage. I definitely had the rage um, and the um, petulance that this, this character has. Um, that's, I can tell you that that's all of, from high school to college, that was me. And actually, I mean, it was, I, it was all, for me, it was it's all combat boots, jeans, leather jacket, like through all throughout, I, I would say the end of high school, most of college, like that was, that was me. Rage Against the Machine, just, it, it was, for, for me, it was like elevator music. It was like, it was like, great, in the sense that it was like, it's, it's like an everyday thing. You know, mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, that, I, I, and I kid you not, like, I used to fall asleep to, to um, Nine Inch Nails. Okay. That was my thing. It was like, and people used to ask me, like, how do you fall asleep? I was like, I don't know. It was like, ah, 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 ah. it was like, for me, for me, it was like, that was, that was calming for me. Mm -hmm. um, but the rage, I um, completely relate to uh, that point in my life and, and, and Johnny, where there was a point where I was angry at the, I walked angry at the world. That's what I what I what I was, and it felt that it was my power. It was my strength um, to be. I, it was the only way that I was able to take control um, of of me and the world. It, it's because I figured that I can't control the world, but I can control me, and I can control how I react to it. And so it had to be with rage. And so. Um, which is then why I was in, in, in a couple of rock bands, and, and that, that made, you know, that gave me my, my, uh, I, I, my voice to, to express myself and, and, and show that. Um, uh, I did not fall into heroin addiction or, or alcohol addiction. Uh, Same other drugs. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I do uh, remember... Um, getting in my own way because mm -hmm. um, of the anger um, as well uh, and, and feeling like everything was everything was a fight everything was a battle everything had to go, go um, or feeling like the world w th was something that I always had to fight with and I feel like a lot of young people fall into that mentality at yeah. one point in their lives uh, whether it's in young adolescence adolescence or early 20s or mm -hmm. something they, they feel that need to rage mm -hmm. Against the machine, you know, for... Yeah. Uh, it's just one of those universal things that we tend to go through. And, and so you're taking that to your character. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, I mean, literally, it just reminds me, it reminds me of me. Um, and also the, the bravado of, like, I'm going to conquer the world and not have a real good plan about how I'm going to do it. But I know that... Uh, that that uh, I just need to just be in what because Johnny has this thing about it, it was it was like I'm just gonna be here and everything's gonna come to me and everything's just like being in the city and the city's gonna feed me and I'm gonna feed into the city I'm gonna be part of it which is like you know um, uh, the song Boulevard of Broken Dreams is like you know like I'm part of the darkness I'm part of the 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 the, the fabric of the city you know um, um, the the uh, 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 I walk these empty streets on the boulevard of broken uh, of broken dreams, where the city sleeps, and I'm the only one. And I walk alone, you know, feeling like like it's just me and doing it. Like th th I feel like that uh, I was I was that guy. I was that kid. I felt like he was like, yeah, I'm I'm part of the fabric of the city. Um, I'm an urban warrior. Um, and and um, and everyone's gonna hear my art. Everyone's gonna feel my art, whether 
you know? Like a loner feel to it, too. Like, I've got this on my own. Yeah. Exactly. It was like, you know, everybody dies alone no matter what. Even if we're together, all of us are going to die alone, you know? <laughs> so, so you know, it was it was uh, definitely had that kind of anarchy kind of mentality. Um, and then, you know, grew up. <laughs> you grew up, but, but you know, and, and then the hormones die, it, it level out. <laughs> and, then, yep. and, then, and then, you know, um, but I have to tell you, like, between that time and rent, there wasn't a lot of time between that. It, it was because then, cause then uh, you know, after that, very much like Johnny, at one point, Johnny ends up working a straight job with a tie and all that. That's what happened. <laughs> that's what happened yeah so i went from you know combat boots ripped jeans to like uh um uh suit and tie to uh five and a half inch platform heels that's outstanding <laughs> yeah yeah all within a little short period yeah. of time okay all right and the music in american idiot green mm. day it, yeah it's phenomenal and it's ageless i feel like yes uh, because Green Day themselves has been around for decades. Yeah. And yet, when I'm a middle school teacher, and when I go to school, I still see the 6th, 7th, 8th graders with Green Day t-shirts on. And they can tell me the songs that they sing in their favorite Green Day song. And that that's that speaks to the timelessness of the messages in yeah. the songs, which are yeah. woven into this show. And that is powerful. Yeah. It's the poetry. The poetry and how they express the emotions that... That that uh, make you feel like they hear that that you're heard, mm -hmm. whatever the darkest or the lightest or wherever it is, uh, it, you feel there's there's so, there's always something in 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 the whole album of where, where you can relate to just just a little bit. And yes, it's just you know, for lack of a better phrase, it's just a bad ass album, well composed and well thought out and. And uh, it's one of the best punk albums I've heard. Still, to, it, it's a funny story when 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 Robbie Soto came to me with with this project. Um, I've never seen the show, um, but but uh, I knew the album because when I was in in San Francisco to start shooting Rent the Film, I took two albums with me. Um, in my little CD player, CDs again, things that we used to use. Um, there was um, Snoop Dogg when he came out with with um, um, uh, like it's hot, and it was the Green Day album American Idiot, and it's the two things that I played over because it, it, it just came out. Actually, the American Idiot just came out in two thousand and five came out in 2005 that's what i listened to because i was because in in the core the core of me um the core of me is i'm i'm rock like I, like that's and that's also why it's so strange how i ended up in red and musical theater it was like but it was like people anyone who really knows me knows that i'm i'm all about like my father just raised me on Jimi hendrix Cretans, Cre clearwater and i have a thorough education in all of that which is actually what inspired me to be even be a musician and 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 want to be a rock performer i wanted to be a rock star prior to all that it was like it was like this is this is all i'm going to it's like is it, either either i'm going to be a dancer but i knew it was going to be in the arts or 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 i'm just i'm just going to be like a front man um, in a, in a band and really hard uh, and and so this show really speaks to me. So th this is is um, yeah, it's it's something that that I feel again that I was meant to do. The moment that he mentioned it was like, yeah, I know this. I I I'm kidding? I know this album. Yes, I'm ready for it. It's funny the the musical director of this show. I just wanted to mess with her the first time I I saw her uh, the the first day. Um, that we were going to run through music, I say like, I, okay, I have I have something to tell you. I, um, I know I've heard a couple of songs of, the, of 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 this album, but I don't know any of the songs. Um, I I I don't know what the show is about really, but I I I don't know any of my songs or any of the melodies. And she and she looked at me with kind of, and I can see what was going on in her head. <laughs> she she had that smile. Um, cause she's, she's also a teacher, a music mm -hmm. teacher. And, sh and she's like, she's like, 
well, okay, this is what I'm here to do, is here to do. It was like, I am so messing with you. I know this whole album backwards and yeah. forwards. I was like, how can anyone not know this album? That's you know, uh, I love this album. I'm, I'm, very, I'm just very happy to do it. Okay, so here's my last question. Mm -hmm. American Idiot. We've established that it is, it is timeless. It's an amazing album. It's an amazing show. Why is it relevant today? Oh my God, um, to feel, uh, you know, to feel ostracized, to feel like, like you're, you're the community of the world at large disappoints you, to be distrustful of the government, to be, uh, to get in the way of yourself, either through drugs, and, and, and let's just talk about the character specifically about Johnny, um, who's uh, falls into heroin addiction, very un unlike Rent, um, where you know someone di someone dies and actually comes back to life at at the end. Um, but Angel does die. No one dies here, and then luckily uh, they survive it. Johnny is a very lucky character to have survived his journey from from. Uh, from I guess very severe drug addiction. Her heroin is one of those drugs that, that is not designed for you to get off of it. Mm -hmm. It's not designed for that. It's designed for you to stay on it forever until the day you die. Um, uh, and it be either be the cause of it or, or uh, um, you just manage to live with it and then still die from complications of it. So uh, now we're talking about, um, we're talking about fentanyl. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about um, people that, that don't survive these addictions and how rampant it is and, and, and for whatever reasons, what they use to escape um, their lives, or their, their whatever lives, be, be it urban life, suburban life. Um, Johnny is, is, is a lesson of, of um, I mean, and I guess it's it's sort of more fairy tale because there aren't a lot. There aren't again. There aren't a lot of people that sort that that go into heroin addiction, and then come out the other side and go like, okay, I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I'm done. I've learned my lesson. It's brutal. <laughs> it's, it's brutal. Um, it's relevant. It's a relevant. It's a relevant um, issue. Uh, there's there's um, how uh, people come back from wars, vets, uh, disenchanted. Um, they go in there with with, with an idea uh, idea of what they think the world is and why they're doing it, and they learn their lessons. Either they come back even more entrenched within you know nationalist ideals, or 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 they get more of a sense of self. And then there's there's the the issue of of uh, you know. Um, I guess un, uh, I would say uh, un unexpected preg pregnancies and people um, like, trying to escape the responsibilities and and uh, you know Mike actually is one of those characters that that that, that uh, he uh, life is happening to him life is happening all, all around him and and he feels like he's missing out of like oh, hearing from from Johnny's experiences in, in in the big city getting trashed going to rock concerts and hanging out with like uh, you know a fantastic girl and Tony you know at war then he meets extraordinary girl and he feels like you know you you, you can just imagine like how like I mean, apparently like he spends so much time just sitting and, and drinking and then life is happening behind him as uh, he has a child and and uh, um, you know, you know, there's that of how you consider like what is real life, what is what is living, uh, and and uh, these are all pertinent things that are happening all the time around us. These are all these are all issues that that are uh, relevant, uh, and as you said, timeless. They're, they're time. It's been, it's been going on forever, mm -hmm. and they it this it's managed. The show has managed to put it in, in in such a way that that you're able to get it. it you're able to 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 at uh, once sympathize with each character and see and and the music guides your emotions as well, which is why it's, it's so well and it's punk. But it guides your emotions. I I I can tell you that every single time I hear 
the the last 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 song of, of the show it gets me every single time it gets me in the same way of hearing the final no day but to dun, 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 and hearing the last the last one of the last things that you know it in the darkest night if my memory serves me right i will not turn back time forgetting you but not the time that is one of the saddest things that i've ever heard every single time hearing and, and every and everyone sing it behind us forgetting you but not the time forgetting you but not the time lose losing so much because johnny loses so much uh, after he comes full circle he has to go he has to go realize like that's this is what i had to um not just give up i lost it i'm never gonna get that back all right this is growing up and he and and how does he end the show this is my life life goes on life goes on you make your choices yep and you and you're lucky to if you survive it. Mm -hmm. But um, I have to say, as 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 a, as a complete rockhead, um, I'm I'm going to quote uh, uh, um, Jim Morrison: "No one here gets out alive." <laughs> this is true. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else that our audience should know about you, about American Idiot, about anything we've talked about? I'm a proud father of a one-year-old girl. Uh, she is the uh, love of my life, and um, and I've also been in the process of working on a show called Surviving Williamsburg, um, and uh, some of it, um, some of the songs are covers, and some songs I'll be writing myself, and and uh, I performed it three days um, before my daughter was born at a New York venue, and. Um, when I have more time, I'll be able to finish it, and hopefully she'll be able to see it. Well, I know she'll be able to see it. <laughs> so, That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll be looking out for that. And come see American Idiot, please. Absolutely. <laughs> and to do that, go to actforall.org. You can find the links to the tickets for that show and all of our other shows with ACT and with the ACT Black Box Theater Studio as well. Again, actforall.org. You can also find it on your favorite social media account. That's it for today's interview. I hope you guys had fun meeting Wilson and getting the big nut worth of all the stories. I like that one. I'm John Hall, and I hope you have a great day.